長門よあこんな勇者の慣れの果ての場。Welcome back, everybody. Today we're discussing Shogun Episode 7. After a few weeks of me trying to catch up with this new hit series, we are finally here, ladies and gentlemen. This episode was a stressful journey that gave me some flashbacks I was looking for and then finally stuck a dagger in my chest. I seriously have no idea how this story ends, though I do have quite a few theories this video, and I cannot wait to get into it. The episode begins with a tease. Lord Toranaga's name being called out after a decisive victory that left me wondering if this was a dream or if they really skipped over the entire battle we were preparing for. Instead, it is a flashback to the boy warlord sitting atop his steed and looking across the bloodied land that he conquered. This was his first battle. 46 years ago. The defeated lord gives his compliments, calls him a virgin, and then formally surrenders. He leaves this earth with a remark about the roles of fate one day being reversed and asking him to be his second. It is a moment that haunts Toranaga throughout this episode. This man wanted a legacy to recall that he fought well and with honor, and that starts the overarching theme of this episode, and that's legacy versus reality. This beheading by Toranaga was not as swift as the tales recall. This legacy Versus reality theme really paints Tornaga in a less than perfect light compared to how he's been displayed up to this point. They make him appear as though he doesn't have a plan, like he is scattered, like he is in a corner, like his back is against the wall, and even the benchmarks that made the world view him in such a positive light have been skewed. The words that give things power, highlighted from episode 5, make us question his very legacy and who is speaking when Tornaga's name started meaning more than just. Being a boy. This was such a great way to make us uncertain about our heroes actually winning the battle. But as we will talk about later with Jin, my heart is still kind of telling me that Tor Naga is still in control. Perhaps the letter we saw him read last episode but never heard the contents of was the reporting of his brother in law being offered this regent position. And despite the entire episode being about skewing our perceptions, He may still have what it takes to beat his enemies. But let's not get too far ahead of ourselves, because we first see Toranaga meeting his half brother. Hiromatsu says that if his brother declines to join them, the battle is already lost, and that sets the tone for this meeting. A resounding yes and a loving brotherly bond is the only thing that will keep the odds balanced, and we wait for that with a bated breath. The meeting was great. This goofy penis hat was everything that it needed to be. The conversation starts off by reminding us of the earth. Quake and the losses they experienced. Toranaga needs him, and he knows it. After a brief moment of insulted tension, they laugh and call each other names. Truly, the best marker for a positive male friendship. We learn that his brother was basically put aside and left to guard resources that get very little attention. He says that Toranaga tamed a white boy, and they have him dance around a little bit like the clever monkey he is. John minds his manners in these moments and even speaks some decent Japanese before leaving, and Toranaga explains that John's cannon tactics are crucial. To their cause. Now that I am all caught up, I hope you are ready for some theories. Most will be wrong, few will feel like I cheated and wrote the show myself, but all of them are just sharing my thoughts and like we're buddies standing around the water cooler. My thoughts on how things could be, on how scenes would be cool, all of those things. And with that unnecessary disclaimer out of the way, here is point number one on why Tornaga is actually still in control. And it starts with this single line here. He tells Psyche directly about his mission, about the Thing that gives them the advantage, the crucial thing to the operation. It is a bold thing to do, and it doesn't feel like something that a person who keeps his heart hidden from most of the world would actually give so freely and so openly. He told as few people as humanly possible about his plot to escape Osaka, so why would this be how he behaves with crucial information? He tells Psyche this information, but later when John breaks from the harsh and very strict protocol, Psyche just lets him leave, knowing this man is crucial to Toranaga's operation. I think that leaves us with two options. Either Psyche forgot that this man was. You know, crucial, or he allowed him to leave because he knows this man is crucial. And despite all of the bad press that this man gets this episode, it is entirely possible that he is in on the mission and Psyche letting John leave is actually doing something for Tornaga's cause. But let's keep moving. 
Psyche shouts to Toranaga's army, declaring their eagerness to spill blood by their side, and we come to Toranaga's tent and a discussion about Lady Jin's pricing. He purchases Lady Kiku's time for one week at the price of 12,000 manmei and a one-stick meeting with her. Seeing as that is the name of this episode, this stick of time has much importance, but we will dive into that later on. They call John in so he could be reminded to be on his best behavior, insisting that he wears his swords and not his pistol. On the second watch, with the theories of this all being Toranaga's plan still on the table, it seems like this could be hinting that he knew about the unruly and shocking moments to come and did not want John shooting Psyche in the head before the plan could come to fruition. At least if he has swords, like, you know, he, he's probably not going to be good with them, right? <laughs> um, Toranaga has not made a decision about the ship or if John is to use that during the battle, and Mariko insists that he does not take it further. John, of course, does. He questions the gifts and the titles and the Operation Crimson Sky. Again, Tornaga is dismissive. John says that he is ready for whatever fate may bring, and they part ways. We hear the greatest voice of all time talking to Omi and basically telling him to stop simping. He is essentially in a parasocial relationship and did not know it. The lines from before where Kiku was like imagining a life if he had more power, now we know that those were just pillow talk. Doing what she's paid to do for the people that often reach for things that they will never have and Omi learns that Lady Kiku will not be available for one week. I talked about this in my last review, but Toranaga may be doing this purposefully to get back at him for what he did to Nagakado, and I think that that is still where my heart is, but I don't really know. I don't know. I don't know. It, it, it could also be like on the surface, Lady Kiku is just the number one hoe, and gifting your allies the number one hoe, that's just proper manners, you know? Lady Jin lets some information slip, and that is that John's mind was on somebody else last night, and I think he knows right away that that was Mariko. We then see Hiromatsu visiting Fuji, delivering the remains of her husband and son. She wants death after all is said and done, and he wonders why she doesn't wish to exist in the glorious time of victory that they helped create for her. She doubts that victory will ever come, and I think that reflects the general feelings of the populace at large, not just the showrunners telling us that a single person has doubts. We then see Psyche bathing, enjoying the hot springs while his soldiers and Toranaga's officers stand watch. Nagakado says that the first kill that someone experiences on a battlefield is better than their first time with a woman, and those that have actually seen battle laugh. It's a great way to start the friendly banter between two factions of people, and then of course it takes us to the infamous meeting. Going into the scene, something was giving me red wedding vibes. Perhaps it was seeing Psyche without a goofy hat and realizing that this was a face of a perfect villain, or perhaps it was the general feeling that everything was going a little too well. They talk about the moments of their past, Psyche poking fun that Nagakado must be slaying puss just like his father did, and Tornaga laughs. He says that his uncle was clearly more gifted, to which Psyche mumbles under his breath, more lies. Omi stirs the pot and makes Buntaro think about the duty his wife is performing with John, just trying to be a little shit and like he did with Nagakado, you know, push someone to action. And because Buntaro doesn't let those feelings get the best of him, this may come back to bite Omi in the butt now that there are multiple people that have been incited to do things, you know, at the behest of, of Omi and... Yeah, it's just, it's got to bite him in the butt eventually, right? <laughs> um, Nagakado searches for more stories, and this is where things really start taking a turn for the worst. They say that Tornaga took the head off of his enemy with a single swing, and as we learn later, this is just not possible for a 12-year-old to do. They move on to Lady Kiku, and we see Omi fighting back demons as Psyche discusses the fun that he had with her. Psyche then wants to discuss the plan, and what Tornaga intends to offer for his help, while Tornaga wants to wait until they aren't drinking anymore. He suggests all of Uzi, which is Yabushige's fief, and the reason that we get this funny shot of him going... Uh -huh. Quickly, the half-brother switches to more stories of the past, using this moment to tell all of the respected people of Tornaga's world that he shit himself when he was given to a rival as a child. It is a story that did not invoke laughter, and the disrespect was felt immediately, even though he claimed he meant nothing by it. He keeps focusing on Nagakado through this moment, asking if he prefers legends and stories or the truth, and this was the moment I knew everything was about to go down. He was drinking, the stories were flowing, so it could have just been a dumb man being a dumb man, but to tell Toranaga's son directly that the legends of his father were different from reality, 
That's quite the devilish move. And of course, that's when the scout comes running from outside, declaring that the armies are surrounding them. All of the roads have been blocked off and all but Toronaga react in fear. Before things get bloody, Toronaga calls his dogs down and Hiromatsu is thrown a letter from the council. It's an invitation for Toronaga to come to Osaka and accept punishment for his treachery. That Saiki was there to receive his answer and escort him back to Osaka as the new regent of the council. Psyche says, who could refuse such an honor, serving the realm, and then delivers the order to commit seppuku to Nagakado. Toronaga breaks from his stoicism and demands that he doesn't accept the letter. It's interesting because I don't really know what not accepting the offer or accepting this piece of paper really does here. He's just avoiding the court summons by pretending to not see it. But seeing as how Toronaga breaks from character to demand something from his son, it makes this so tense. Toronaga says that he and his vassals will remain in Ajiro until tomorrow at sunset where he will give his answer. It turns this entire episode into a waiting game, trying to figure out how he gets out of this trap, and his inaction here speaks volumes. He doesn't poke at the defenses, he doesn't send Buntero to, to Edo for more soldiers, he thinks and thinks and thinks, and I'm assuming what he decides is an answer out of this situation, but truly, they do such a great job of making this episode feel like one big L for Tornaga. John asks Mariko about what it means for him to accept. She says that he will be marched to Osaka and then executed along with a dozen of his officers. John doesn't realize this in this moment. Well, maybe he does because, you know, they wanted to execute him before, but as a Hatsumoto, he would probably be expected to take his own life as well. John wants to make a swim for his boat to do some quick repairs and then Mariko interrupts, asking exactly what he would do. If he would run or if he would fight against Toronaga's wishes, being the underlying question here. He is stumped and says that anything is better than standing around and doing nothing, which then brings us to Toronaga, who from the outside is doing that exact thing. We see him throwing stones at this gate. I'm not sure the exact custom here, but it appears like it could be either luck related, like wishing on stones, and if they land, that means good fortune, or it could be skill related, like he needs to do this operation perfectly, not too much strength and certainly not too soft. He needs precision to fly to the top and then to rest there, he needs an exact execution. And the missed stone makes it feel like the showrunners are begging us to believe that he is not going to make it, even though it's just a, a little stone. We then see Psyche talking to Yabushige, telling him that they have received his message about a secret peace deal he was trying to make happen. They reply with a severed head of his general, just like the head of Josen that Ishido received a couple episodes ago, showing us exactly who he blames for this happening. It feels like Yabushige cannot believe his luck here, and it takes us to John seeing his boat being blocked in by a much larger vessel flying Lord Ishido's flag. We then see a reflective moment for Toronaga and his officers discussing what exactly his silence means. Buntero wants to make a run for Edo, but Hiromatsu denies the request, citing scouts watching them at all times. If we think back to episode one, the lesson to Nagakado was about being a falcon in the sun waiting for the kill, an allegory about operating in plain sight, in such clear view that you are obfuscated. Toronaga is in the mountain of prying eyes, in as clear of a view as you can be. We would be fools to believe that he was not obfuscating his true intentions in some kind of way. Nagakado is ready to fight to the death, and an exhausted sigh comes from Toranaga, along with a note questioning why those who have never fought are always the most eager. Toranaga meets Lady Jin along the way and honors the promise to her, a single stick of his time. At this point, I still had no idea what this meant, aside from a moment of his time to discuss something, then of course we see it burning. This was kind of cool. I want to start telling people that, that like this is the amount of time I have to give them. <laughs> this, just, this just seems so powerful. I love this. Um, she is there to ask for land in Edo to continue her tea house empire. Now, he holds his prized falcon, the Lady of Steel, and the allegory that I just talked about comes to mind. It seems like the show uses this falcon to remind the audience of his wise allegories and his cunning ways in conversation, and I don't think here is any different. Of course, my mind is still on her being the Society of Amida leader, so I'm really just waiting for that bomb to drop this entire conversation, but... Honestly, maybe she's not, right? I, I just, I really want to highlight that. That is what I'm thinking in these moments, but, you know, that could just be my confirmation bias as I'm, like, going through this and reviewing these episodes. Or, perhaps, 
Maybe both of them know exactly who the other is, neither of them actually able to say anything because they live in a world that spies on each other. On the surface, she wants the Willow world under his protection. It is a gamble on a dying man in his hour of need. And I think even if the scene isn't a cryptic exchange, which I think it is, this is enough. It was a vote of confidence in him when honestly that just wasn't happening from anybody else but she's here to discuss a guild of courtesans and alludes to them not being in brothels but in true tea houses the only thing we really know about the willow world is that it is good at getting men's rocks off and collecting information citing mariko saying her and john's every move was being watched last episode and jin even teasing omi with information about what happened within her walls a guild of courtesans under the protection of toranaga created with willow world standards excluding the one about getting men's rocks off kind of sounds like an all-powerful information gathering spy girls organization but you know that's just me then the conversation gets a little more real Time's up. They talk about fate being a sword wielded by those that can use it for their benefit, about how his advisors believe that he may die in the near future, but she just does not see it like that. That her terrible childhood has led to her being the most powerful woman in Izu, just as his terrible childhood did similar. It is a bold line from the mistress of a tea house, and I think that if she is more than that, she is subtly saying as much right in this moment. She wonders why this cunning man that grew up and must operate in similarly terrible ways did not see the army closing around him, that any spy could tell him it was coming, maybe even including hers. I think at the very least, she's saying that she knows that he has spies, and perhaps that information slipped from Lady Kiku after getting close to Omi at the start of the series. Maybe that's why Omi and Kiku's relationship is so important. It is to show us that from the very beginning, there has been these spies collecting information, and that is the true power that's happening behind the scenes. She wants to know why he let himself get captured here, and it's so cryptic because the showrunners are trying to make us forget that Tornaga is that dude. I think he let himself get captured and maybe even has his half-brother in on the plan because this is how they are going to deploy Operation Crimson Sky. They are about to openly and freely march to the capital, face to face with the other regions, and I can only hope the battle starts with John on his boat, firing shots from across the city. She then brings up the mistakes that he made in this position, and he denies any of this being his will. She smiles and apologizes, saying, what does she know? She's just an old whore. And I swear to God, if she isn't the leader of a spy organization, just put a fork in me. This line is too perfect. It's too good. Like with all the things that we know, oh God, it, it must be her. She's, it's gotta be her. She's just too good. It's too good. I love her. I don't know. She then leaves and we come to an intense meeting at the hot springs. Yabushige strips down damn near naked in front of them to show a lack of fear. He isn't bothered if they want to watch his weenie get bathed. They also show us Omi and Nagakado bathing together. They question if his father has a plan and Nagakado demands that he must, that surrendering isn't possible. Omi then brings up his old life being so peaceful compared to what it is now, and still cursing the moment that he pissed on that barbarian. Nagakado calls his opponents spineless pigs, still wrapped in a conversation with the man that manipulated him to killing Josen, having absolutely no idea, and then allowing the entire conversation to be heard by Psyche. He comes out of the cave, his men close behind, and I truly thought we were about to see these men be murdered in this pool. Instead, his uncle talks shit, and on rewatch, he kind of gives Nagakado some real advice here. Once again echoing what his father said about not wanting to go into battle, and that death is nothing to honor like he does. Basically saying, don't go getting yourself killed before you've even had a chance to live. The scene is meant to be ominous, from the man that just betrayed us, but... The literal words that he delivers, if said by a peaceful man with good lighting and an upbeat song behind it, would just be a motivational speaker. We then come to a rather interesting moment in this episode. John looks out at his ship, studying it, perhaps trying to find a weakness in their defenses so that he could make it out there, but is then joined by Yabushige. It's almost like they're peers, and this sword fight with Yabushige was... It felt like he was truly trying to do something, um, you know, for John while also trying to be a piece of shit and like, you know, poke fun at the man who kind of like seemingly ruined his life. And Buntero watches and waits behind this tree, jumping into action the moment John is on his back and he can cut his throat. He doesn't. 
of course, he shows restraint that he probably wishes that he didn't have. And we come to Fuji practicing the Naginita, Nagi Naginata, practicing with the Naginata. If that is how that is said, commenters, please let me know. Also, commenters, thank you for naming the weapon last review. Appreciate that. Nagakado and Fuji talk. I really enjoyed this interaction. He has such an honorable view of death and wishes that he was the man who gave his life to say a single thing to someone disrespecting his father. It's nonsense. And truly highlighting the Kool-Aid drinking that can come, that can be problematic in cultures that value the greater good or the narrative over the individual. Fuji as well wanted to die this episode to be with her husband and her son as ashes. She needed to hear this from somebody that is appearing unhinged and ready to die because that's what it is. It is nonsense. And I hope, given what happens to Nagakado, Fuji starts valuing her life more than wanting to be ashes. I also hope that this happens for Mariko, though we will talk about that a little bit later. We see Toranaga writing his will and giving Jin two cho of land in Edo for her to do whatever with. It is a measurement that I am not too familiar with, but perhaps someone has seen a Reddit thread explaining it um, because I have not seen that just yet. Essentially, I'm like, I'm sure it's like two acres or, you know, two plots, right? It's, two, it's some kind of measurement. Ultimately, he grants her request. And if he dies, that land goes to her, which then brings us to Mariko and Buntaro. He asks that he be allowed to kill John and accuses he and his wife of cheating. It is drama that Toranaga doesn't care to discuss, nor does Mariko want this being so loosely thrown about either. But when Toranaga takes a direct approach and says that to kill John for this, he would also have to kill his wife, she kindly accepts whatever fate as property her husband wishes to hand down. Of course, we know that she wants to die. Her remark is as cold as she has ever been, and it seems like it breaks Buntero. He wants to be in love with this woman, but hearing that she doesn't even want to voice an opinion about her own life with him and would accept death without a fight, he's fighting back tears. His heart is broken. He doesn't know what to do. I mean, he's a piece of shit, but like, if you're, dude, again, like there's some part of me that does feel for him, you know, They're, like it's Jamie Lannister all over again. Fuck, this is such a good show. Tornaga isn't having it, and after Buntero leaves with an answer he didn't want, Mariko gets a lecture about her priorities yet again. He asks if she is with him in a fight against her father's enemies or if she wants to be with the barbarian. After hearing this question, she doesn't answer. She breaks, affirming the loyalty that she has and the service that she has provided, but begging for death just the same. She wants to be freed from a cursed life, and Tornaga smacks the knife from her hand. It is an insult to the Lord that is facing death himself and his servants requesting to die and, you know, say that the life that he provides to them is cursed is not a vote of confidence right now. Which then brings us to the meeting. Tornaga sits in front of his flags, having flashbacks to the enemy he defeated all of those years ago, sitting in front of his flags. Tornaga talks to Hiromatsu about his first execution, revealing that it was not a single swift strike that ended the life, but nine, and it was sloppy and messy, painful, and made his death terrible. They laughed, and then in comes the rest of Tornaga's men. Each bow and take their seat beside him, and wait for the plan that their leader has created until Psyche, who hears it at the exact same time that they do, enters and they gasp as he surrenders. Both Yabushige and Nagakado stand to voice their opinions, and he denies them. They are to remain silent and accept this utter defeat. He says that when there is evil in this land, nobody has the right to tear the realm apart. It is a line meant to explain that he wishes to follow the rules above all else, for the honor, for the order, for the peace, and ultimately to go peaceful into that dark night. But I really don't think that that is how Tornaga is going to operate here. Like I said before, I don't believe it. I think it is all a ruse and Tornaga is prepping for a fight even when it seems like all is lost. Part of me does wonder if he truly dies though. If this isn't the original Ned Stark moment and he truly dies before he can stop the insidious plot that works against him and his country. John then stands up, calls out Yabushige Nagakado before chuckling and walking toward the exit. He mocks Toranaga, and while the words may not be clear to everybody, it was obvious that he was upset with Toranaga. In Japanese, he says that they are all dead, and then he storms off. Now, right away, my first thought was, why doesn't anybody stop him from leaving? And truly, part of me is still unclear 
about that. But if Psyche is on like the Crimson Plot plan, after hearing that this barbarian was their secret weapon, again, he may simply be letting him go. He is either underestimated here and not a threat entirely because everything is still surrounded, or they know that he needs to be with his men and his ship and perhaps there is a plot to reunite them going on in the background. We then see Psyche having some rainy clouds with Lady Kiku. The tie around his neck made me think that any second we were about to see the secret assassin in her break out and start murdering him, but it doesn't. It felt like they knew, like the showrunners knew that we were looking for this based on how everything was shot. Perhaps they aren't the Society of Amida and simply the information gatherers, or simply they're ladies of the night, and I am mistaken. All in all, I loved the scene though. She says that she has tools to elevate their play and I 100%, 1000% thought she was going to kill him when she got back. I don't know if she was just lucky or if she knew that they were coming, but it was fortunate that she was not there when you know everything went to chaos. I listened to the scene a few times for some kind of call or whistle, but nothing seems to have alerted her. She just leaves for some anal beads and then Nagakato comes in with the poker. Psyche makes a run for it, even in this moment, not trying to hurt his nephew, but save his own life. And then the unexpected happens. Nagakato slips and cracks his skull open and bleeds out in the Willow World Tea House pool. It was brutal. And if this was on somebody's bingo card, you know, congrats. You either like are a fortune teller or read the book. <laughs> um, this was such a shocking reveal. And I hated how long we had to watch this happen. This was... I mean, heartbreaking, disgusting. This was the death that he idolized. But with that, we come to the end of the episode. This, oh my gosh, this was such a shocking end to an incredible episode, and I cannot wait to see how Tornaga responds next week. I love this possible new villain. This dude is a perfect bad guy actor, and I want to see him just obliterated if he truly does harbor some malintent to my, you know, my lord and savior, Tornaga-sama. I think that Tornaga is still in control, despite the show's haunting attempt to, like, show that he isn't, and our heroes, like, I do think they will prevail in the bitter end, but it's not going to be clean. It is definitely going to be messy, and I cannot wait to see it happen. Thank you to everybody that stayed this long. Please be sure to leave a like, comment your favorite part of the episode, and subscribe for more content just like this. Much love, everybody, and I cannot wait to talk to you all again soon.